In the murky underbelly of Prohibition-era New York, a formidable presence emerged, Oni Madden, a figure shaped by the relentless pulse of the city's clandestine avenues. Navigating the dim corners of Hell's Kitchen to concealed gambling parlors entwined with Broadway's heartbeat, Madden orchestrated an empire that cast an ominous shadow over the metropolis. With a masterful touch, he became the puppeteer of covert dealings, his enigmatic influence echoing through every hidden corner, weaving a tapestry of notoriety that would forever etch his name into the annals of American criminal history. Oni Madden's journey began in the heart of Leeds, England, on December 18, 1891. Born Owen Vincent Madden, to Irish parents Francis and Mary Madden, Oni's early life was marked by tragedy when his father, a cloth dresser in a flax mill, passed away. In pursuit of a brighter future, Oni's mother ventured to New York, leaving her children in England until she could secure their passage. Reuniting in the tenements of Hell's Kitchen, Manhattan, the Madden family faced the harsh reality of meager wages and challenging living conditions. Influenced by the tough environment, young Oni embarked on a path of crime, initiated by a fateful incident during a routine shopping trip with his mother. Witnessing a thief's success ignited a rebellious spark within Oni, leading him to choose the wrong side of the law. Hell's Kitchen, a gritty neighborhood with the 9th Avenue L rattling overhead, became the backdrop for Oni's formative years. The area, known for its perilous Death Avenue and filled with slaughterhouses and dingy saloons, shaped the environment in which Oni learned the criminal arts. The prevalence of knife fights and the constant danger on the streets further molded his perspective. As opportunities for adolescent males in Hell's Kitchen were limited, Oni explored various avenues, including newspaper hawking and pigeon breeding. His talent for raising pigeons earned him prestige among bird hobbyists. However, the allure of a life of crime proved stronger. Teenage boys in the neighborhood often sought belonging in gangs, and Oni Madden was no exception. He joined the notorious Gopher Gang, a local mob that terrorized the community. This set the stage for his teenage years filled with crime, violence, and the challenges that lie ahead in the criminal underworld. The Gophers fiercely protected their turf, armed with clubs, knives, brass knuckles, and blackjacks, against attacks from rival gangs like the Gashausers, the Five Pointers, the 14th Street Gang, and their archenemies, the Hudson Dusters. In times of crisis, they could mobilize up to 500 street fighters to repel their adversaries and maintain control. During his time with the Gophers, Oni also befriended George Raft, a future dancer, actor, and film producer. When not engaged in conflict, the Gophers specialized in burglary, particularly targeting railcars in the west side train yards, which were packed with various commodities. Young Oni Madden gained notoriety for his fearless and cunning exploits, leading the Gophers in breaking into freight cars and outsmarting aggressive railroad guards. Legend has it that Oni Madden earned the moniker Oni the Killer for allegedly committing multiple murders while still a teenager. One notable incident involved him bludgeoning a shopkeeper to death with a large metal pipe at the age of 14. Despite being detained, he managed to avoid punishment due to witnesses refusing to testify against him. At 19, Oni shot a romantic rival vying for the affections of a woman he admired as they boarded a trolley. The wounded man informed a policeman of Oni's involvement before succumbing to his injuries. However, witnesses disappeared or refused to testify, leading to Oni's eventual release. Frida Horner, a blonde who hung around with the gang, was one of Oni's several steady girlfriends. However, Frida saw less of Oni when in 1911, he married one of his other girlfriends, Dorothy Loretta Rogers. Frida would then hook up with William Moore, or better known as Little Patsy Doyle. For a while, Oni and Dorothy lived at his apartment near 41st Street and 8th Avenue, where Dorothy gave birth to a baby girl named Margaret. In reality, 
their marriage barely lasted two years. Surviving a violent ambush at the Arbor Dance Hall in 1912, where rival gangsters shot him, Oni emerged with a new nickname, Clay Pigeon. He declined to talk to the police about the incident in accordance with the Code of Silence. Initially, newspapers speculated that the gunmen were associates of William Henshaw, the victim of the trolley car murder. However, it quickly became evident that the Hudson Dusters were involved. Within a week, a few Hudson Dusters who had made the attempt on his life were murdered. In Hell's Kitchen, it became evident that Oni still held sway despite his prolonged recovery. However, one individual, Doyle, a notorious killer from the early days of the Gophers, hesitated to acknowledge Oni's authority. Doyle resurfaced, insinuating that Oni's injuries had left him permanently disabled. He spread rumors that Oni's reign was over and hinted at his own bid for leadership. There were whispers, not entirely implausible, that Doyle may have been involved in the Arbor incident. Doyle's disruptive behavior was intertwined with his relationship with Frida Horner. By this point, Oni had defied tradition by allowing non-Irish individuals, like his good friend Tony Romanello, who was Italian, to join the Gophers. Oni didn't discriminate based on nationality or race, extending protection to select Irish families in New York and Chicago. Over time, he earned the trust of the Mafia, becoming one of the few non-Italians privy to their inner workings and sought after for advice on crucial matters of appointments and succession. His closest associates included Frank Costello and Jewish mobster Meyer Lansky. Not long after Oni was back on the streets, Romanello was found clubbed, stabbed, and shot after taunting Patsy Doyle about Frida Horner. On October 23, 1914, Oni was arrested and charged for pigeon rustling. Many harbored little doubt that Doyle was somehow responsible for this. However, Oni posted bail of $1,000, convinced the magistrate of his innocence, and was subsequently acquitted. In November 1914, Oni's henchmen confronted Doyle, shooting the aspiring gangster at close range, where he succumbed to his wounds, sprawled in a gutter just outside a saloon. Although Oni himself didn't pull the trigger, the district attorney believed he had orchestrated the murder. Indicted alongside his two henchmen for first-degree murder, Oni faced a sensational trial marked by compelling testimony from two young women, described as gang malls or camp followers. One of them, Frida, who was previously Doyle's lover, changed sides and claimed Oni had meticulously planned the murder, while the other asserted that Oni had ordered Doyle's killing. Despite presenting alibis and witnesses attesting to his absence during the crime, Oni's explosive temper during cross-examination marred his testimony. Ultimately, he was convicted of first-degree manslaughter, sparing him from the electric chair but resulting in a severe sentence of 10 to 20 years in Sing Sing State Prison. Following an unsuccessful attempt for a new trial, Oni's associates coerced money from businesses in Hell's Kitchen to finance further legal endeavors, but the court dismissed the newly revealed evidence as unreliable. Oni the killer was paroled in 1923 after about seven years in prison. Returning to Hell's Kitchen, he found his old gang disbanded, with members either jailed, dead, or joining other groups due to changes in gangland brought by the Volstead Law. Like many others, Madden turned to liquor trafficking. In December 1923, he and two others robbed a bonded liquor warehouse in New York City, but the case never went to trial. Shortly after, he was arrested for stealing pre Volstead liquor in Massachusetts. Despite providing an alias, his fingerprints exposed his identity. At his arraignment, he claimed innocence and escaped prosecution once again. The district attorney of New York County, incensed by Oni's parole violation, aimed to return him to prison. Despite Oni's repeated arrests, the parole board disregarded the DA's request. Oni's early forays into bootlegging revealed the profitability of the trade, but he lacked the capital to expand. Fortunately, Big Bill Dwyer, known as the Tsar of Rum Row, provided the necessary funds after hearing about Madden's exploits. 
Oni began his post-prison career working for bootlegger Larry Fay, gradually establishing his own empire with the connections and money acquired. He cultivated an image of a refined businessman, opting for custom suits and a distinctive gray fedora hat, alongside a black shirt, white tie, and gloves, although the reason for the gloves remained ambiguous. In 1924, Oni Madden ventured into brewing, acquiring a large brick building in Manhattan to establish the Phoenix Bottling Company, formerly known as the Claus and Flanagan Brewery and later renamed to the Phoenix Cereal Beverage Company. Despite prohibition forcing the brewery to produce near beer, Madden openly operated the Phoenix plant, manufacturing Madden's number no. one, a popular amber beverage. Although he maintained some level of protection through payoffs, occasional raids disrupted operations. Nevertheless, Madden adeptly navigated the legal system to quickly reopen after closures. In September 1926, federal prohibition agents raided Phoenix, confiscating 130,000 gallons of beer. Despite initial losses, Madden's past experiences enabled him to resume operations smoothly. However, in 1930, a routine inspection led to the discovery of a concealed loading platform and pipeline, resulting in the revocation of Phoenix's dealcoholization permit and subsequent closure. Subsequent investigations in 1930 and 1931 resulted in significant losses, with prohibition agents seizing equipment and thousands of gallons of beer. Madden fought back legally, contesting the validity of search warrants used in the raids. Despite court orders to return Phoenix's assets, the U.S. Attorney's Office continued appeals. Legal battles, including a padlock order, temporarily halted operations, but Madden's determination ensured the brewery was operational again before Prohibition's end in 1933. After repeal, the Phoenix Brewery was sold to the Flanagan Aid Brewing Corporation, with Major Thomas Lanfer, a World War I hero, appointed as its head. Many believed Oni Madden, who had received flying lessons from Lanfer, remained a controlling partner behind the scenes. New York City's thriving speakeasy scene offered Oni Madden a lucrative opportunity to expand his ventures, partnering with George Jean Demange, also known as Big Frenchy, a former adversary. Their collaboration resulted in numerous successful speakeasies, with the Cotton Club in Harlem standing out as Oni's flagship establishment. In 1924, Oni, Demange, and Arnold Rothstein purchased the struggling club, initially managed by former heavyweight champion Jack Johnson, transforming it into a trendy hotspot. Renowned designer Joseph Urban revamped the interior, attracting fashionable crowds with diverse menus and high-quality bootleg liquor. The Cotton Club's allure, featuring lavish musical reviews headlined by Duke Ellington and his jungle band, made it a must-visit destination for tourists in New York City, with performances broadcasted nationally on CBS radio. Despite Oni's efforts to cultivate a sophisticated yet edgy image for the Cotton Club, occasional law enforcement scrutiny posed challenges. In 1925, a judge ordered the club's closure for three months, following numerous complaints and pressure from Mayor John Hyland. While facing hefty fines, Oni managed to avoid imprisonment, emphasizing reform efforts and quickly reopening the Cotton Club with a high-profile review. Amidst the competitive landscape, the Plantation Club emerged as another notable speakeasy on 126th Street in Harlem in 1929, evoking the ambience of the Old South. However, the club's success was short-lived, falling victim to a destructive raid allegedly orchestrated by a rival club owner aiming to eliminate competition, though no concrete evidence was found to link anyone to the attack. During Prohibition, hot springs attracted tourists seeking open access to drinking and gambling. Notable mobsters like Al Capone and Oni frequented the area, with the Belvedere emerging as a prominent gambling spot. Capone's visits initially centered on business negotiations with local moonshiners, but he developed an affinity for the baths and the town's laissez-faire vibe. Oni's introduction to hot springs came through a friend, 
an ex-boxer undergoing hydrotherapy. Driving his impressive Dwesenberg, Oni caught the attention of locals, including Agnes Demby, whom he courted despite initial reluctance. Despite being married, Oni pursued Agnes Demby, finding her charming and different from his usual companions. His brief stay in Hot Springs was marked by courtship and eventual departure, leaving Demby with a train ticket to New York City. As the Great Depression loomed, Oni faced financial strain, with reform movements gaining traction in New York. Governor Roosevelt aligned with reformers, vowing to tackle corruption and organized crime. Public sentiment turned against mobsters like Oni, leading to increased police scrutiny and numerous arrests. Upon arriving in New York City, Oni Madden faced parole violations that could send him back to Sing Sing Prison. Despite being out for over eight years, his manslaughter sentence wasn't due to end for another four. Oni had repeatedly broken parole rules, but the parole board lacked concrete evidence until then. In February 1932, the state parole board convened at Sing Sing to determine Oni's fate. Despite arguments and affidavits in support of Oni's claim of discharge, the New York Appellate Division unanimously overturned the ruling, mandating his return to Sing Sing for the parole board to determine his sentence. Oni Madden, cautious about returning to prison, evaded authorities before finally submitting to Sing Sing on July 6, 1932, after spending time with Agnes Demby. Legal battles ensued, with bail attempts denied by the Court of Appeals, affirming the parole board's authority. Following an interview, the board ordered Oni to serve an additional year for parole violations. Incarcerated at Sing Sing, Oni maintained a low profile, earning the nickname Oni the Hermit. Despite health issues, he worked diligently, even tending to the prison greenhouse. Considered a model prisoner, he earned an early release in 1933. Upon release, Oni found his criminal empire diminished due to law enforcement raids and the economic downturn of the Great Depression, leading to the closure of some speakeasies. In 1934, Oni divorced his wife, Dorothy Madden. Intrigued by Hot Springs, where his sweetheart resided, Oni saw potential in the town's small-town rackets. He obtained permission to relocate under the pretext of health benefits and strategically ingratiated himself with the local elite to establish himself as a new vice kingpin. Despite public scrutiny, he redirected his attention to his illegal enterprises in Hot Springs, operating discreetly to avoid unwanted attention. Following his final parole interview in 1935, Oni married Agnes in a quiet ceremony in Arkansas. Oni Madden relished his role in Hot Springs, operating the Southern Club, a popular hub for entertainment. He sought U.S. citizenship amidst World War II, eventually succeeding before the end of 1943. Madden's influence even drew the attention of notable mobsters like Lucky Luciano, who was apprehended at the Southern Club in 1936. Oni Madden passed away in April 1965, marking the end of an era in organized crime.